Hey everyone, so I'm finally done with my exams and thought I'd make a video discussing a topic that has been requested many times by my viewers. In this video, not only will I unbox two different SSDs, one from SanDisk and one from Intel, so that you get an idea of what the package contains, but I'll also discuss some of the fundamentals behind a solid state drive. That way, I hope you learn at least a little bit about SSDs instead of just watching me mindlessly unbox products for the next couple of minutes. Some of the items that I'd like to quickly cover include the advantages of upgrading to an SSD, secondly, choosing the correct capacity drive, and I'd also like to discuss other items such as the input-output operations per second of an SSD and the reliability and life expectancy of these drives. If I miss anything, please feel free to leave a comment adding that item. Additionally, I'd like to say that I'll upload a second video demonstrating the installation process for an SSD in a MacBook Pro. This second video will also show you side by side the benefits that an SSD provides with respect to performance when compared to a 5400 RPM traditional hard disk. So the first drive that I'm unboxing, as you can probably tell by the image on the screen, is the SanDisk 128GB SSD. My laptop uses a SATA 3 connection in order to connect hard drives. So this is a SATA 3 drive with read speeds of 490 megabytes per second. Like other SSDs, the SanDisk SSD is a 2.5 inch drive, which means that it will fit in laptops. It does not come with any accessories, however, like a 2.5 inch to 3.5 inch adapter. So this will need to be purchased if you plan on installing the drive in a desktop. Additionally, the drive comes with a three year warranty. One thing that I'm really not fond of with this SanDisk drive is its build quality. It feels really plasticky, unlike the Intel drive that I'll show later on. Of course, the Intel drive was a little bit more expensive. At this point in time, you may be wondering, why would one want to switch to an SSD from a platter-based hard disk? Although SSDs are more expensive than platter-based disks at the given moment in time, they offer two main advantages. One is performance, while the other is reliability. While traditional 5400 RPM drives reach read and write speeds of around 50 to 150 megabytes per second, SSDs reach speeds of upwards of 400 plus megabytes per second. This exponential increase in the input output speeds translates into faster booting of operating systems, launching of applications, and overall system responsiveness. Of course, the speed of an SSD depends on the controller that the drive uses. There are many controllers, including Marvell and Sandforce. So look at the specifications of your desired drive to see what controller it uses and the speeds that this controller can attain. When it comes to reliability, SSDs also have an advantage over platter-based drives in that there is no mechanical parts in motion. Platter-based disks have a typical life expectancy of around 4 to 5 years before wear and tear can lead to permanent data corruption. In the past, SSDs were also plagued with a high failure rate due to controller related issues. However, many of these issues have since been resolved as advancements in technology have been made. Many drives have been tested to last over 10 years in real world usage. Aside from controller issues, it should be noted that the NAND flash that is used in SSDs also has a limited amount of writes that can be made to it. Despite this limitation, SSDs are still practical to switch to from traditional platter based hard drives. The Intel 530 SSD that you see on the screen at the moment, for example, has a life expectancy of about 1.2 million hours if no controller failure occurs in that time. With everything said, it'll take many, many, many years before the cells in your SSD can no longer be written to. Additionally, the larger the capacity of the drive, the longer the life expectancy, since the same cell will not be continuously overwritten to. It will take many years before the cells in your SSD can no longer be written to. When this occurs, the SSD will be converted into a read-only mode. Consequently, as long as the controller for the drive doesn't fail, you'll still be able to access the data that's stored on it. To make matters even better, technologies such as MLC increase the amount of writes that can be made to a cell. So, the life expectancy of these SSDs will continue to increase. MLC stands for multi-layer cell and it allows for about 10,000 program or erase cycles per cell. On the other hand, TLC stands for three layer cell, which allows for about 5,000 program or erase cycles per cell. The third thing that adds to the reliability of an SSD is the fact that it has no moving components. Therefore, they are more impact resistant than platter based disks. 
So here we have the Intel 530 series SSD. It is a 120 gigabyte solid state disk and once again uses a SATA connector. The SSD will be installed in a MacBook Pro which accepts 2.5 inch drives like other laptops. The MacBook Pro uses SATA 3 connectors which support drives with a read and write speed of up to 600 megabytes per second. It should be noted at this point in time that the SATA connectors are backwards compatible. If you have an older computer with only a SATA 2 connector, you will still be able to install a SATA 3 drive into that computer. The only difference will be the fact that the drive speed will be bottlenecked by the SATA 2 connection, which only allows for around 300 megabytes per second read and write speeds. The Intel 530 series drives have a sequential read speed of 540 megabytes per second and sequential write speeds of 490 megabytes per second. The random read and write of this drive is 41K and 80K respectively. So right off the bat, you can tell that the build quality of the Intel drive is far superior to the SanDisk one that was unboxed earlier. The drive is enclosed in aluminum and feels slightly heavier than the all plastic SanDisk SSD. Additionally, unlike the 3 year warranty that was included with the SanDisk SSD, the Intel one includes a generous 5 year warranty. Intel has a reputation of building long lasting reliable SSDs and the 530 series is no different. It uses a Sanforce controller and tests by Anantech show that this drive can endure up to 20 gigabytes of data transfer per day continuously for a period of over 5 years. That's a lot of data transfer, even for an enthusiast computer user. A close competitor to this drive would be the Samsung 840 EVO series. Unlike the SanDisk drive, Intel is also known for including several accessories and thus contains essential items such as a SATA cable and a 2.5 inch to 3.5 inch adapter for mounting the solid state disk in a desktop computer. Yeah, and it even comes with a Speed Demon sticker that you can put on your laptop or wherever else to tell the world that you have an Intel SSD in it, if that's your thing. While I further unbox this product, let's talk about the price of solid state storage. The SSD shown in this video costed about $69 and $89 respectively. It is undoubted that the price of this form of storage is decreasing over time. A few years ago, I purchased an OCZ branded SSD that was only 64 gigabytes in size, and that cost me $69. Since then, we have had the introduction of terabyte drives for around $500 or $600. However, at the moment, I would say that the sweet spot for an SSD is around 128 gigabytes. As long as you do not store a lot of media on your primary computer drive, 128 gigabytes is enough to fit both your operating system as well as some frequently used applications. In my personal laptop, for example, I still use a 64 gigabyte SSD to this day. Of course, I removed the optical disk drive in that MacBook and replaced it with a 160 gigabyte hard disk to store media on. I find that this is more than sufficient for me. Now, I'm almost done unboxing this product. As you can probably tell, Intel includes quite a lot of accessories with their SSDs, which is always nice. In the last minute or so that I have left, as I struggle to free this desktop adapter, I want to discuss a myth regarding SSDs. If you're a gamer, an SSD will not increase your frame rates that you receive in your games. Your CPU and your video card are responsible primarily for determining the FPS that you achieve. An SSD will decrease the load times in your game significantly over a platter-based disk, but it will have no overall impact on the performance of your games. Keep that in mind when you're deciding what to upgrade next. This is basically how you mount an SSD onto the 2.5 inch to 3.5 inch adapter. The adapter itself then slides into the hard drive bay in your desktop case. I hope you learned a little bit about SSDs by watching this video. If you want to give your older laptop a performance boost, I would highly recommend getting one. It made a night and day difference in the responsiveness of my 2008 Core 2 Duo based MacBook Pro. At this point in time, I will attach a sample video showing the difference that an SSD can make in the performance of a laptop. Moreover, keep an eye out for my second video that I'll upload later on this week demonstrating how to install an SSD in a MacBook. That video should be interesting since I will have three different MacBooks with three different CPUs 
to play around with and conduct performance tests on. As usual, thanks for watching and please feel free to leave feedback. I really appreciate all your support. The computer on the left hand side is my old 2008 MacBook which has the Core 2 Duo processor and is running on an SSD. More specifically, it runs on the OCC Vertex 2 SSD which uses a SATA 2 interface. On the right hand side, we have a newer 2010 MacBook Pro which is currently running on the 5400 RPM standard hard disk that Apple provides. It has an i5 processor. So while the iFi laptop is still on the Apple logo, the Core 2 Duo laptop is ready to sign in to OS X. And there you have it. It's completed booting up and now we can just launch a bunch of apps while the iFi laptop is still on the Apple logo. One thing that I forgot to note is the fact that my Core 2 Duo laptop has 8GB of DDR3 memory. The i5 on the other hand has 10GB of DDR3 memory and there it's finally booted up.